some previous city council decide to treat them differently, and more importantly, why did they decide to treat them differently? In the days before time, <laughs> and I don't know what are the answers to those questions. I really don't know when it started. It's been going on for a long time. Before, before I got here. No, I don't. Probably as a as kind of a service because sewer blockages can be a little traumatic. Depending on where they're at, they can you know, be bubbling up your toilet and like John mentioned, you know, water bubbling up in the toilet. So one thing, sewer bubbling up to the toilet might be something different. That's your that's your best guess. That's my best guess. I don't really have anything else I can give you on that one. Okay. Uh, and again, probably started when we were much smaller and able to provide that kind of thing. Um, could be as simple as, you know, some councilman or city manager one day decided that that's what he wanted to do to avoid complications. Okay, thank you. It could have been that that's how they got people to hook up to the sewer. My neighborhood would be a septic tank. Yeah. Yeah. I've asked and no one can really put their finger on it. Thank you, sir. Uh, we're going to move on to the next item on the agenda, which has to do with development standards. Um, in one way or another, this was requested by uh, three council members, uh, Gilmore, Vaughn, and Ferguson, to address a variety of issues. Uh, the title that you have on the slide here is Improving Development Standards, but the real questions have to do with <coughs> things like the uses of specific use zoning, uh, some of the issues that we just got through talking about in the retail sector, why do we have certain types of retail or, or businesses in certain locations, is there anything we can do to control some of those if we feel like there are too many of them or not in the right places or not of the right quality. Um, some related topics to zoning and use uh, that we talked about before as a council. Some of you, of course, wouldn't participate in this previously or concepts like amortization of use. So I think he's going to talk a little bit about that. And uh, finally, there's some <coughs> interest in the degree to which city the city might uh, encourage green development or green uh, uh, redevelopment. And by that, I mean uh, green space 
what you maybe used it earlier, but I'm kind of talking about uh, things that are more sustainable energy wise or uh, environmental. So, kind of cover all of those, it's going to take some time, and uh, I think it's going to start out, and uh, we'll see where it goes. Okay. Thank you, Claude. And uh, this is you kind of noticing that we're following a the theme from last night to this morning. Too. We are basically, because we are in the redevelopment mode, this is our opportunity to do certain things differently and take a look at our ordinances. And I think this is the best time uh, for us to be looking at that. This is actually one of my favorite presentations to make because I do make it about once a year at TNL. Uh, and specifically, I target it to, of course, you know, we've we had a lot specifically for us here, but I do make a general presentation about improving development standards, setting up your development standards for small cities especially as they are growing. And because uh, if you do it right the first time, then, you know, then that, that, that sets the trend. So, um, and then uh, because of my experience both in Louisville and Keller, I always showed both city halls when you know, we took Keller's out this time. But mainly because a lot of cities put a lot of uh, emphasis and do the best with their public buildings. You know, our public facilities are just beautiful. We spend a lot of time, we spend a lot of resources, a lot of money. And, and what we need to do is basically expect the same thing from the private development. Because we are investing our money into this community and so in, in, in return, we need the private developers to do the same. So once a project is constructed, and this is, this is the first slide I always start with, it has a life of 30 to 50 years. Because once it's built, it's going to be there for about 30 to 50 years. And the next chance you get is after that time frame to do something with it. And I guess fortunately for us, at this point, we are at the time of reaching for a lot of our existing developments. We are reaching that 30 to 50 years. And Specifically, we are going to touch on uh, I-35 redevelopment because we have a lot of our developments along I-35 that were developed in the city of the So if we create a sense of place, identity with development standards and enhance building design, which are architecture, our communities will continue to be viable, vibrant, and sustainable. So the, our project goal uh, as we move forward is to stimulate an investment and revenue. Uh, strengthens community image and identity uh, with a stronger sense of place. Emphasize quality, sustainable development, and get the right implementation tools because that is the major thing. We can draw plans and, and have a lot of policies, but until we have the right implementation tools, none of those are going to come to fruition. So, what is how do we define a sustainable development? A sustainable development is a development, development is high quality, high value at the time of construction that keeps its value and quality over time, that has timeless aesthetic quality, low maintenance and energy efficient, uh, and provides for economic development and growth in tax base, has the ability to be to be used as adaptive reuse, as in if a, if a business goes out of the building, if the building has that quality, it can be reused very easily. It's a lot easier to go in and get a new tenant for that building versus if it didn't have those qualities. And of course, it has the quality of life. So, <coughs> so we have some current conditions, and this is just not us. Any city, especially what we call the first ring city, such as the Whiskey Carroll, the Farmers Bank, when they initially started developing, these, these are some of the, uh, you know, in the 60s, again, 50s, 60s, 70s, these, these are some of the, some of the conditions that, that we, we have. Yeah, especially along, these are some pictures that were taken along I-35. Well, if you think about this historically, you can go back into the early part of the uh, 20th century when there were virtually no regulations of any kind. The cities would allow almost anything to happen. And it was really only in the early part of the century that the cities began to assert more control over development activity. And it's been an evolution. Um, it's been kind of a gradual process of uh, trial and error, what works, what doesn't work. Uh, there have been some focuses on use historically by cities. That seems to be changing, and you're just going to get into that a little bit, where the focuses aren't so much on use anymore as they are on form and function. <coughs> um, and there's a big difference. But uh, again, cities 
classically been a little hesitant to go too far with regulation for obvious reasons. And I think that's uh, beginning to change uh, to some degree, again, gradually. But a lot of what you see out there is because back in the day when those properties were developed, that's what was pretty common. And I think Todd hit on one, one thing that is basically the lessons learned at some of the new communities that you see coming up, well, they're very lucky because they have learned lessons from us. So the, the, as you go further off for growth and development, they, they are kind of looking at some of the older cities and where they things should have changed, and now they're, they're changing. Yeah, so so they, they are new, in a better position. Yeah, so you see these new communities <laughs> that people typically reference, well, they didn't start developing until the late 80s or early 90s. Well, heck, the rules were completely different in the 90s than they were in the 30s. But, but in that, what are they going to be 20 years from now? Well, that's They're going to be question. the same thing. Uh, that's a good question. Well, maybe, maybe not. Yeah. Because, if, again, if, you, if they had started, they took certain precautions, then you're not going to have. Right. But everybody thinks they, they are putting precautions in place. <laughs> they do. They do. They are. Yeah. I mean, you look at the city of Houston. That was only regular. And, you know, some people like it, some people don't. Uh, it hadn't hampered their growth. It hadn't hampered their, uh, the value of their properties there. People were still moving to use them and still building buildings and whatever else. There are different ways of approaching the issue, and a lot depends on what the community wants it to look like, you know, how they want it to function. Houston's is kind of a wide open gunslinger. Yeah. My, my deal on Anything this, goes type of place. Sometimes you can overthink this stuff, stuff to the point that all you're doing is excluding things. You can get over control. And that's always been the reticence of, of cities in the past is to go too far and you start maybe shutting things down. I think one of the problems of Houston though is that most of that growth has been not in the inner part of the city. It's gone further and further out, especially the north. They're somewhat bound on the south side. They can't go any further. Sure. The north. They're going but where the land is. Yeah. So, yes, so that's what's happened here. But we've got limited land. That's what I'm saying. You go where the land is, then you have to do something else to get them back in. You have to redevelop. Of course, you know, but Houston also controls with a lot of permitting issues, not development yeah. issues. So they have that, and they have a lot of private issues. Yeah. Of course, they have the big ones. The other community is just looking at it. So let me ask you. Since you just brought that up, we can't tie legally for the council. Council, we can't tie a request for deed restrictions to zoning, correct? But if you didn't have zoning, can you require deed restrictions? Deed restrictions, and of course, both Claire and Ms. here. But they are historically private. They are private covenants. It's the private ownership that needs to put those restrictions on. Well, are you suggesting we get rid of all our zones? No, I'm just asking. <laughs> <laughs> no, but if we have this property that if you want to take away the zoning, could you require deed restrictions on that property? The way I see deed restrictions, they're private in nature. Not that they're private in nature, but I think you can control, if you had a vacant piece of property, you could zone it for a certain use. Yeah. And you could also require that that property establish a set of deed restrictions that covered A, B, C, D, E, and F, which we felt like that was important. It might not relate to the use directly, but it might relate to how that property is going to be maintained or dealt with in the future. But it wouldn't be tied to the zoning. It wouldn't necessarily be a zoning because again, zoning is, is focused strictly on use. It would be more of a development requirement, much like landscaping or how many trees you have to plant or something like that. But we have taken deed restrictions into account as a city. Louisville? Yeah. Well, I mean, no, we just not did, really. no, not, just recently we had one where there were certain deed restrictions there. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, we deal with them kind of on and off. But yeah, they offered it as part of the deal. Yeah. Right. But they I think what Dean's talking right. about are, are large, Classical sets of deed restrictions that govern a piece of property very regionally. Typically, what you see in the large homeowners associations in, in uh, residential development. And kind of going back, that's what Houston is focused on. They, they have an approach essentially that says that on the commercial side, wide open. 
They won't zone it. You can do anything you want just about. There are some development and permitting requirements, but not many. Signs wide open. In the residential subdivisions, I don't know that Houston has regulated this. I'd have to research that, but I know that the private sector has basically established the residential subdivision since about 1970. Almost every one of those subdivisions has been developed with significant deed restrictions in place, voluntary deed restrictions, and then passed on to subsequent owners. Many of our form based developments, are they usually deed restricted? Is that how they create that? No, no, they okay. are within the city ordinances. So, okay. one of the things is that we have used uh, our zoning ordinance, is what I call fairly, um, fairly simple. There is no complex zoning procedures in it, where other cities, again, in the newer cities, they have more complex zoning processes that allow, that's allowed within the law, such as plan development. Uh, right now, we have mixed use zoning category, which does allow the city to require certain things from the beginning. If they come in, you need to provide A, B, C, and D. And, and the city council has the ability to decide once they see those, those documents to say yes or no to the zone. So there are abilities within the zoning laws, and we can place that, and we're going to cover that as part of this presentation that we, it would basically take us a little farther and put the city more in control. Because in those instances, the, the city is more in control versus these restrictions, which is including the private property. So again, there's just some examples. So we want to move towards improved standards and implement new development standards to improve conditions. Uh, previous city I was in, we did just about everything for plan development. So basically everything that came in, and it's very staff intensive, and at times they can, uh, you know, drag on and go for it, and, and it's not the, something that I'm recommending that every project that comes in go through that process. Uh, but this this is a, this is a loans in, in Keller that, you know, of course, initially when they came in, that's not what they wanted to do. They, you know, so through that development process, uh, the council was able to negotiate some things with, with the developer. Um, same thing. Is, I, I do have a problem with these. It's still a loan. They still have trucks there. You still go there and buy nails and wood and everything else. It's just that you made them do something else. It's pretty though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To ask Farm Out about the Home Depot out there that they made pretty uh, on 2499. The market, the market, the market, absolutely right. The oh, market still has to be there. Yes, definitely. But would this loan keeps its value over the years versus, no. you know, yes, it, well, I don't know, you know, the pays of you probably, but there is, the, in terms of enforcement, you know, and, and Eric is here with enforcement, they, there is no outside storage that you have to go control, there is no complaints that you receive on, on certain things that you do on, on, some, on some of our units that in certain businesses. Well, another thing so. with Lowe's is I think their construction model, you know, their, their whole plan is around a 20 year max life of, of, of that building project. and then they're gone. And so the question then is, you know, what's the sustainability of this building for other purposes? And, and I think there is a difference between this and the loads that we have. Uh, I know what, when, when they developed it, they said, yeah, you've added a you know, million dollars to the project. Well, if that a million, even if part of it is added to the value of the project, it's just on the ground, that's, that's good for us. That's good for that kind of taxes. So certain development standards, which goes to like uh, masonry standards, higher landscaping, higher street treatment, and, and parking is, uh, is uh, some of those things that, that we, we like to talk about. This is again one of the project that, that, that kind of like I like to touch on. It came in as a body shop, basically. This is a body shop. And you know, this is their base on the side. Well, a year later, they went out of business. It was very easy to adapt this particular body shop to an office user, just because of the development standards that were in place for, for, the, for the community. Uh, th this, I, I know we have as part of my slides, this is a, a GTE Verizon uh, yard, basically. So uh, they have screened you know, everything that you see uh, in, in front. So it, it's not, you know, it's a use that that's the use, as we really said. But at the same time, can you do something to make it better and, and to create a better identity that you want? Uh, things.
things like having uh, pavers on the sidewalk, again, landscaping against the building to soften the building. So these are some of the issues that, that um, availability for people to sit outside on the cafe. And again, creating that environment that we had talked about, that sense of place. So you could accomplish that through what we call design guidance. You could have design guidelines. Right now, we could implement certain design guidelines within our general development ordinance. And as new development come in, implement those design guidelines so you get a little more desired effect, I guess. That's where the council would like to go. And as part of our uh, I-35 redevelopment plan, we have developed a fairly intensive design guidelines that can not only be applied to the I-35 corridor, it can be applied to the rest of the city. One of the things that we have uh, that I think has worked really, really well in Louisville is the uh, corridor, uh, the, the special corridor and we have for the uh, gateway, the gateway ordinance, which basically talks about development uh, standards on gateway streets. Well, that could be applied to just about any street in the city. So all the new developments that have come out on our gateways follow a different set of standards than if you come on Cornell Street, it may not be a gateway street. But any public street could be considered a gateway, and those set of standards could be applied to, to basically cities that come in. Primarily the reason that that uh, set of guidelines were implemented was because they are more visible. But truly, as you drive through the city, just about anything can be considered fairly visible. Uh, so we have we have looked at typologies through the, developing the I-35 plan and uh, how the how, this is this goes back to form ba form based codes and how do you uh, locate the building so they would have the best visual impact and although uses in the buildings may be a variety of uses from the aesthetic viewpoint from the outside you could locate them you could have uh, you could have again connections between uses, between buildings, landscaping, provide pedestrian amenities, uh, some of the things that, again, Jason and John were talking about at the last one. Should these pages come up a uh, draft document for the I-35 plan oh, right correct. now? That's correct. Uh, I'm going to pass that around so you can kind of peruse it. Right. And, it, and it's, of course... get a feel for what that type of uh, approach does. Again, it's a draft. It's a draft format. We haven't adopted it, but what the thing is, once the council takes a look at it and if we adopt that plan, then we can take these certain guidelines and put it in ordinance format so that we are implementation, implementation to, to, to this portion of the So creating open spaces, uh, you know, how can we how can we implement this within basically any any development that comes in now, going back to what we had you know, been uh, been has been which is place making, creating those destination areas, creating something that's a little more uh, the, if you look through the, the, the document, we, the, we have set guidelines for building form, how, uh, how the building would be best in different categories, how it would be best uh, situated on the street, uh, building lighting, uh, internal courtyard plazas and open spaces, guidelines on that, hardscape design. One of the issues, some of you have been uh, working with Old Town. And one of the issues that has come up there is uh, tinting of the windows that you can't see through. So you have a retail and behind it, it's all gone. And actually, within these guidelines, we have established some of those criteria for, hey, the purpose of a retail district is to be able to see through. And, if, and if, if you have a use that you can't do that, then mitigate it in a different way, like have a display with the wrong stuff. So, so as we're walking on the street, you have that that ability to do that. So the, all of those issues and some of the issues that through the year you have discussed with me can be handled with design. And of course, gate, the gateway elements of public art, uh, those, those are all things that can be incorporated into, into uh, any development. Our implementation tools are design standards, construction standards, corridor guidelines, overlay districts, and specific use public art. Specific use permit process is one that we have not utilized in Louisville, uh, and that a lot of our area cities are using, and that's uh, in place of that deed restriction that, that we're talking about. Basically, you, you can control certain aspects of development in this specific use permit process. So, with design, yeah, you might spend some time talking about 
talking a little bit about the last two, what they actually are. The it's at the end. So design standards basically creates a unified design theme. Uh, it's a standard of high quality construction, consistency, and appearance. It's creating a streetscape incorporating pavers into sidewalks, intersections, special treatment areas. Creating the street edge with architectural standards uh, such as short columns, steep walls, uh, in conjunction with landscape. Uh, you have design standards that utilizes, for instance, masonry screening walls, uh, masonry walls along your, your streets for screening, uh, loading docks, outside storage. We have uh, we have a uh, or an issue with outside storage right now. The places that have outside storage and the way they screen their outside storage. So those are some of the things we can implement in our standards. So outside storage would be looked at differently. And uh, in, you can incorporate the same thing into your standards for signage and identification documents. Uh, when you go to construction standard, we can define what masonry construction is, for instance. Uh, is it hardly planned wood siding or is it truly stone or brick construction? So those are some of the things that we can define. Uh, we, can, we can limit the use of exposed metal exterior finishes, which I think recently in the ordinances we've done that. Uh, and limit temporary buildings. Temporary buildings sometimes are not temporary. And, and I think we have run into those situations. A temporary building is not going, building that sits there for 10 years is not a temporary building. Hmm. Are we speaking commercial or residential? This is primarily your commercial standards. Um, overlay districts. An overlay district is basically you have your standard, your standard zoning doesn't go away, it's there. What you create is an overlay on top of the standard. Normally it's along a corridor such as I-35, some place that you want to have a little impact standard. You have already created that here in Old Town. And the reason the developments in Old Town are going through extensive review and, and certain additional design guidelines is because of what we have already established in the ordinances. So think about that, and you can take that to, to other districts. You can create districts. You can create, designate a, an area like I-35 and create an overlay district on top of it, uh, which would be, it basically has a set of different, or what I call higher design guidelines development standards, which is for sign, landscaping, uh, uh, other other codes as you know, as, as you want to create a, a uh, an image for, for that particular district. Again, exactly what, what you have done for all uh, so and the way you implement it generally and we'll get we'll get to that in terms of you know, uses that are already existing you basically technically you're, you're leaving them alone. You don't require everybody to comply as soon as you put in your, your overlay district. But anything new that comes in, or anything that's being expanded after you know, to have so much, let's say over 50 percent, then you will require those developers to understand. And that's generally how I see it. And we'll, we'll follow with amortization of uses. And then you have limitation on expansion of uses without meeting the, the new criteria. That doesn't mean that you know you're not flexible, and certain condition doesn't warrant that we basically make those flexibilities. But as a general rule, you want those those criteria in place, and of course, possible amortization strategy. And what that is is so you have set your plan now. For instance, okay, I want to I want to uh, reference Old Town. You have Old Town. You have a plan in place. The plan that has been adopted basically says this is an area of mixed use. Technically. If the city wanted to, if the city council wished, you could proactively go out there, zone the properties in accordance with your plan, which is mixed use zoning, and then as new development come in, then they will have to comply with that new zoning. So you are kind of setting a time limit for some of the existing uses that don't comply with your new zoning to, over time, go away. And then you Place. Now, you could also, on specific uses without changing the zoning, but you must establish a plan first. You must establish a plan so everybody has notice of your, of your plan. The plan has been approved through a public process so everybody has had a chance to participate. But then you could basically say, okay, we have a light industrial district, but 
this area is designated for retail. Eventually, in the next 15 years, these certain uses will be phased away. And we give notice to the property owners. They know that within a certain time frame, the use is not conforming and their stories go away. A lot of cities deal, actually, billboards is one of the, one, one of the uses or one of, one of the uh, major <laughs> components of the of amortization because when cities want billboards to go away they give it a certain time frame and they say after this going too long. So that that's another the strategy. The key thing is to provide an adequate time adequate frame time. that meets any kind of legal scrutiny as to the, the natural expiration of the value of that use. And that can vary depending on the use. It might be fifteen years, it might be twenty five years. Uh, it's a long term Venture. It's something that you're talking about doing over a very long period of time, long after any of us are probably even here. So it's kind of the ultimate long-term council planning process is to say, I've got a use today that I don't like, I'd like it to be gone, but I can't really get rid of it today, uh, but I can get rid of it tomorrow. <clears throat> and by putting the owner on, on notice, and if you do it uh, properly, then they have more than enough time to amortize, hence the term amortization, amortize the value of that use, and it will be upheld by the courts. But these are basically the set of criteria. You may enact an ordinance that stays a period of time after which you're not performing use, land use, structure, or sign should go away. Uh, the ordinance can be specific to an area that you don't have to implement it throughout the whole city. Uh, the provisions must be based on a comprehensive plan, because that plan is the plan that public has, a, has an ability to get involved in, and you inventory those non-conforming uses that, so that is established, and then uh, in terms of detailed map and photograph, and then following that, then, then you, you do it at certain time. So. I'm just trying to think, what was the, we did a similar deal, but it's a much smaller scale on a, just a, a use that was over on Church Street, and they changed hands, and they used it for Hauling vehicles. Well, that was a negotiation. Yeah, that was a settlement of a dispute over a, the use. actual use. Yeah, you know. that, that wasn't using this process. That was more of an agreed to disposition of that particular situation. I guess uh, what I'd like for us to do is, you know, is to go ahead and look and see what are other instances like that throughout the city. If they are, if there are, we go ahead and move forward in trying to. Do the same thing we did with that. In that essence, happen? we gave them what three years or something like that, and then they ended up selling the property, made profit, blew money. It's a better facility. Right. So. right. Those negotiations. You know, any any time we can negotiate what what both parties agree to do. Right. That, that type of situation lends itself to uh, where you have a dispute over the existing use. Right. You you think it's not allowed. They think it is allowed. Right. Or it seemingly has been allowed in the past, and so. We're trying to assert our, our current zoning control and authority, and they're resisting it, and then you come up with a settlement, essentially, that says, all right, I'll let you do it for three more years, but then after that, you're done. And they say, okay, I'm fine with that. So that's a little bit different situation than what this is. This is a more methodical approach that deals with much longer time frames. And then more proactive right. for the city, whether, right. you know, the property will not be in favor of it. But once we act the, the regulations, then they just have to can you do the same similar what we did with that other property? Can you do the same thing for people that aren't keeping their pro property up to cover when they're in violation? Can you do the well, same thing with it. them and work out a, a dispute agreement over the out of code where you have such a period of time at the end of that time? You, but don't do that. <clears throat> Usually what you're talking about here are uses. Okay. As opposed to other code violations. I, I, it wouldn't have to so, so this would be uses with some other. You know, okay. So this amortization process would be something like, okay, we've got this TOD down here, and we want it to be all residential and retail, but we've got some light industrial and other that's already in that space. We go to tell these folks, in 15 years, this is no longer light industrial. Probably longer than that. In 35 years, this is no longer <laughs> light industrial. Um, and and then that's how that works. Okay. So this is what Frisco is doing with the Excite battery plant. Well, uh, they want the feds to yeah. But they want the feds. Yeah, they want to jump that. But they, but they started the amortization process on this. Yeah, that, that was a big part of their. I hadn't heard that they may have. 
and a big part of their deliberations was, you know, if we can't get the beds, then we, at least we can start the process and go parallel. It's usually designed to deal with what are considered uh, historical noxious uses or, or, or less desirable uses, let's put it that way. Something that you don't think fits into the future of the city as well as it might fit into the past of the city. Um, didn't Carrollton do a deal where they advertised a bunch of the car dealerships and stuff they like that? They were getting ready to uh, enact an ordinance that was similar to that. On and didn't they have a change in the council? Yes. There was some flat blowback. Yeah, they all got it. There can be blowback. A lot of this depends, I think, on the level of support in the community, the level of support on the council's part, the, the way you go about doing it, too, and, the, and more, most importantly, the length of time. You give everybody 100 years, you are not going to care a whole lot about it. You don't want to give everybody 100 years, but just to use that as an extreme example, you're going to care much less about what the city might do in 100 years than they do about next year. Well, you've got to have council stay steady with the plan and the idea. As I recall, I think that was the mistake in Carroll because they, they were only too tight on the time. And again, this is not the only strategy. There's so many strategies that you could put in place that help over time change the change change the direction, change change what you want. It just may take longer and some of unless you have very specific area that you want to uh, make see that change happen sooner or, or, or uh, a lot more aggressive than those of them. This is a very aggressive strategy. Yes, I was about to phrase that exactly. Amortization is kind of the uh, <coughs> nuclear bomb type approach in a way. It's 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 designed to deal with something that you don't think is ever going to go away in any other way. Um, and that's why I'm saying that oftentimes it involves uh, uses that are that date back many, many years before any kind of regulation was in place. And so therefore the people have kind of something that nobody else can get today. And it's designed to create a reason for that change in the future. Because if you don't put something like this in place, typically there's no reason to change. In fact, there's many reasons to not change because they've got that existing use and they're not going to give it up for anything if they don't have to. Uh, we have a good example. We have a paint uh, company. We've lost no, I can't. We have very good, but this is pretty good because they're not in the city actually. But they are a paint manufacturer. They bought a piece of property in the city, in our city. Just off the road, college, 15 acres. And uh, their plant is actually close to DFW Airport. But after they bought it, regulations are so strict that in order for the basically they can't they can't move, they have to stay where they are if they want to continue doing what they do. Because even if they move from where they are in DFW to Lewisville side, there's regulations are so huge that they just they can't. So, uh, so th those are, you know. They're better staying in place, and we have certain uses here that basically it's the same thing. But where would they go to operate that same type of business? Anywhere? Yeah, good example yeah. are the uh, oh, sure. That's right. the I junkyards, yeah. the auto yeah. junkyards on 121 that have been there as long as I can remember. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. They go back for a little bit. Used to be nothing out there. Yes, yeah. and that's usually what happens is that something gets established with so very little regulation. Yeah. They were annexed in. Yeah, and then you wind up the annex and then they just existed prior to there being any significant regulation. And so they they got that use, no doubt about it. But there's no reason for them to leave either. It might be something look at Brody probably remembers. We we actually uh, Councilman Mouse was on the council. I remember we talked about this uh, a little bit on the on sort of spots east of town. Out off 121 or out off set. Or if we had done that then, we'd be eight years down the road on the amortization. We did do one, I think, didn't we? Economic Development Corporation. The one that's not there behind the Phoenix Station. The one that, that sounds bad. The one that's gone that used to be behind the Phoenix Station. That wasn't amortization. They just decided to leave. Yeah. It, it, was, it was talked about anyway. And I think that's all that's not there. For a long term thing. To a 25 year whatever amortization, that property right now is not being utilized. But at some point in time, it will be with the growth between us and Frisco, that area out there, that growth would be. And if you get to that point, and at some point in time, instead of it being a whatever it be, uh, junkyard, 
whatever at that time then become a valuable piece of property for development, which the property owner ends up becoming yeah. beneficiary of it too, because now he's got these properties it's worth a lot of money because we're doing that in that area. And then also, strengthening certain languages within the within our ordinances so interpretation won't be so much of an issue. For instance, uh, you mentioned the car law that comes into a general business zone here in Old Town. Well, uh, it, and again, we'll, we'll go through those. So if you have an ordinance that basically says uh, you can't have so much more than, you know, so much storage, then if it, once that car law goes away, the new use that comes in will have to comply with the new regulation. So even though it may be another car law that comes in into this place, no, it doesn't comply. It's because, you know, that previous use has gone away. So the uses that would be very specific and the, and the regulation to be so specific that it's very easy interpreted by staff that, okay, if, then, if the use is not in compliance, even if we have some uses that are in light industrial, right now our light industrial only allows 10% outside storage, but we have certain uses that are in there that have the whole yard as outside storage. Now if that use goes away, the existing use, the exact same use that comes in uh, it's, it's not in compliance, and we could say, okay. But our ordinances are the language right now, it's not in a way that, that it can be interpreted either way. So we can, we can strengthen the language of our ordinances. Isn't a good part of the historical problem here the debacle created by having pyramid zoning structure? Uh, yeah, we do have. It, it is, it is. And again, that's where I started with our zoning ordinance what we call utility, I think, but it's a very, very, uh, when the zoning came, came to, to be in, in, in the 1900s. Is in Ohio. <laughs> the Euclid is in Ohio, that's yeah. right. That's right. You might explain for everyone what he was referring to in terms of pyramids. Basically, so you start with the, with the kind of the lowest number. So let's say our office district right now is the highest restricted district in the commercial zone. So when you go to the next category, which is our general business, it says all uses in office plus this use. Then you go to local commercial, and then it says all uses in this and that plus the next something. So so it just builds up on top of each other. So when you get to light industrial, then it's almost you anything is allowed. Yeah. Or heavy industrial, of course, warehouse and heavy industrial are those two uses that are uh, that, that do allow a certain things that you, you may you may not want. As, as we are grown, but that's why you see everybody, many people come and request light industrial zoning zones because that is one of the most flexible uh, zoning districts. A lot of areas in Vista Ridge is zoned light industrial, but the market, what a market is, is basically market demand and what market is going, market is going to build there. It's not our zoning that uh, that made those restrictions. The market is actually getting, which is what's happening. And actually, the market has built something that's probably much nicer than a lot of things that are allowed, allowed. in the plant industrial. As the market changes, then some of these other uses might come into play. We right. had that discussion with a property up on I 35 <coughs> that's zoned by the industrial, and the developer wanted to put a lot of stuff in there that we just didn't think was suitable for that for that area, mainly outside storage, large amounts of outside storage, and so it creates that dilemma. Used to be versus what is going to be coming on the ground over time. So this is you know we had already talked about this that the time frame has to be adequate for landowner to recoup the investments and provisions to regulate non-conforming land use and structures would be to zone in accordance with your plan and discontinue the uses that are not in accordance with the zoning and the plan put provisions for repair and maintenance, as those uses are already within the next state for the next 20 years, but at least have repair and maintenance, which is, I think, one thing that, that the mayor was referencing, and put provisions for changes and expansion. So one of the things that we can put in place, uh, and we have been working on this for almost a year now, right, Keisha? Yeah. <laughs> and we've been uh, looking at adding a section to our zoning ordinance is this special use permit process. We have, a, we have a section in the zoning ordinance, it's called specific use zoning, and we've been seeing that 
it's very limited. It's got maybe six uses in there that if you, those uses, such as the landfill, is specific use of, you must come in and ask for specific use of, which goes, what it is basically, you see a site plan before the zoning is approved, and you have, they have to comply with certain provisions, and council can add certain provisions to it. So, uh, appurtenances to, to gas drilling was one of the latest specific use permits that you saw. Uh, but you could build that process for certain other uses, and uh, a lot of other cities, especially our neighboring cities, to a high degree, uh, use in that process, basically. So what it does, it allows the Planning and Zoning Commission and City Council an opportunity to evaluate property with special characteristics to make sure compatibility is there in the basic uses. Now, again, this does not change the zoning on the property. The zoning of the property remains the same. This is basically just another layer of permit. Uh, the intent of the district is to allow uh, consideration of certain uses that would typically be incompatible but may be permissible with, with provisions of certain conditions and restrictions. Um, as part of the special use permit process, and Liz and I had a discussion on this, and Liz, please, uh, any comment, is you could have certain time frames on, on these permits. So you could basically allow it for certain time and then renew it, although I understand there's a case law now that is being brought in the city of Dallas. Yeah, in December they filed suit. Suit that, okay. Well, um, Dallas implemented a, a speci uh, special use permit for late night bars, I believe. And um, in December, some attorneys filed suit on several, several issues, and one of them being the time limit on that, on that permit. Right. And basically the suit says that, you know, you can't say, you know, we give you this special use for only two years because technically, you know, the, after two years, what happens after two years? So there is no, that's not that permanent. But that's on certain things, but at least you could tie it to that specific use. So if a, one of the things, one of the uses we're proposing in many storage warehouses. So if a mini storage warehouse comes in and casts it, set specific uses on, on that property and that property goes away, then the next project that takes its place, then you could go back and revisit the specific use permit. And if they're not meeting certain requirements, if you want to add requirements to it, then you could do that action. So at least it allows you the ability to do that. So it's not taking away the specific use permit, but the ability to review it after a certain point, if, if that particular use is, is no longer there. So the specific use permit stays with the property? It, it, it all depends. Sometimes you could just tie it to that specific use owner, or you could have it with the property. Take what, one of the things that and Liz and I had this discussion. Uh, it's almost like a variance process, kind of. But, but again, when I was in Keller, mother-in-law suites were only allowed by specific use permits. Well, once you build a mother-in-law, you know, once you build a separate structure on the same law for, for a mother-in-law suite, then that stays there with the land. I mean, you can't take it away. It's, it's sitting there. You can't come back and say, now you can't use this for, for that specific use that was in place. But if they didn't meet certain requirements as you permitted it, the next user that comes in, the next person, that, then you could revisit that permit if you want to, and even add specific conditions. But that's only when they broke the If they agreement. broke the plan. You can't just go in and change it because you know. That's also why we've always been told here that we don't want to get involved in our PUDs, our PBs, right. the same reason. And it does 